let's be clear, it's day one. Today yes. will be day two. So we'll see more. I think what the Americans have shown so far is trading held up reasonably well, right? Slightly below expectations. IBD, ECM and DCM in particular came up uh, above expectations. Now, the consumer side is holding up reasonably well and the CRE losses still haven't materialized to the extent that people had expected they would have at this stage of the journey. So still lots of good news, but given where banks stock rallied over the last year, expectations are incredibly high. And then you need to keep in mind what happened to the net interest income expectations, mm. right? Discussing Q4 earnings a quarter back, the average expectation probably still was six rates cuts in the US Inflation came up off higher last week than we had expected. So you have a lot of you know, difficulties in actually managing net interest income from a banking perspective, and hence providing forward guidance is incredibly difficult. And so there was probably an element of conservatism uh, in this, which led to uh, investor disappointment. I want to look at rate expectations in a moment, but first I want to get your thoughts on uh, some data that we got in the Eurozone last week. There, the ECB's lending survey suggested that the demand for loans actually slowed substantially. To what extent is this a one-off or is there a reason here for concern? I think it also shows you the macro divergence uh, that we're seeing between the US still going incredibly strong and Europe where inflation is coming down and to an extent that you have seen now expectation continued uh, being there at you know a tuned rate cut uh, and that is very different and lower loan demand also is triggered by higher rates so rates coming down will probably increase loan demand at one point again in the cycle. You know, Christian, banking is a little bit wonky in, just in itself, uh, but I want to talk about something we don't often talk about when it comes to banks, deposit beta. That's what you're looking at. Yeah. Just for clarity, it's the amount that deposit rates increase compared to interest rates. According to your data, that's softening. That's counterintuitive, actually. Um, give me a sense. What does that mean for the consumer banking business? What's that mean for the investment banking business as well? The investment banking business facing a lot of pressure from money markets, just a very strong money market. Yeah. So beta slowing um, means basically that it's good for banks, if you want, from an earnings perspective, right? Because they pay relatively less on the deposits than they do um, charge on, on the lending side. It's hard to judge what is driving it, right? You could argue probably that some of the, the rundowns of the post-COVID savings that we've seen in, in consumers are being run down. There are less deposits in, uh, in the system, if you want. And as you say, a lot of the banks and asset managers have been pushing their money market and other um, uh, investment management solutions over uh, the last couple of uh, months as well. All right, so I also want to talk about the proposals on the U.S. side to increase bank capital. You call it Basel Endgame. I know it's, again, kind of wonky. Um, similar moves considered in Switzerland for European banks. Obviously, that's a move to increase the solvency and increase the confidence. But on the other side, what does that mean for the stock price? What does that mean for investors? So I think the, the Basel Endgame, and it's really called Endgame because we have been talking about this ever since the global financial crisis. Uh, so that shows you how long the journey goes. And it's still in implementation, right? The comments in the US were due in January, and it's now in the political debate on where things will land. Uh, I think the expectation is that it will soften a, a little again. Uh, but it's clear that capital, liquidity, risk management uh, expectations are going up. And what that means, on the other hand, is that private credit... Uh, which is outside the traditional banking sectors, continues to do well. You know, you're touching on private credit. Uh, it's been a, a big competitor to the traditional banking system. I'm just going to look up some data right here. Um, at this, the middle of the great financial crisis, the assets under management and private credit, $1.5 trillion. Now it's up to $7.5 trillion. You say banks, they, they clawed back about $20 billion last year, but isn't that just a drop in the bucket? Isn't private credit, private credit just growing and continuing to be a big competitor? So last year, the banks lost another $20 billion. Right. While it in Q1, to, you said they clawed back In 10. Q1, yeah. they had a sort of a half of that being, being clawed back. That's, that's a drop in the bucket. That's a drop in the bucket. It shows that there are still some muscles, but it also shows where this is coming from is large syndicated, syndicated lending. That's the large banks, right? right? The types of institutions that have reported or will report over the next couple of days. Where there is still softness, uh, particularly in the U.S., is the regional banks, right? Post-Silicon Valley Bank, they're still restructuring their balance sheets. They're still adjusting their risk management. The risk appetite isn't there, right? And that creates more opportunity for private credit.